he looked at me, he was psychic, right? He looks at me and says, you're not causing this shit. This is prophetic. Um, you may be able to affect it. Likelihood is that you won't be able to affect the result, but you're not causing it. I'm like, what? How did you know what I was thinking? You know, it's like, because I'm like you. And uh, he said, I'm going to tell you a story. And I want you to remember this story. Welcome to another episode of Driving to the Rares with your favorite hosts, Larry and Dinelia. That would be us. Yes, it's us. I'm actually really excited about this episode. You know why? Um, I do know why. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> yes, I already read. Let me tell I you about ahead. my latest novel, Team Whisper. Okay, da, da, tell me da. about your latest novel. This one. This was a magic, magic one. It is, actually. And they're all quite magic. Don't get yeah. me wrong. Yeah. This one is a cut and above. Mm-hmm. Shall I read a little bit yes. about this? Okay. Well, first of all, you know, yes. if you're just interested in reading, well, then go to Substack slash Inelia and give it a read. Mm-hmm. Yes. We're going to read the article. You know, article that we published at Substack. Yes. But we'll also, you know, talk about it. Mm-hmm. So here we go. Team Whisper. It- It was a great surprise to me when this novel came into my awareness. It urgently insisted on being written, and right away. And it's inclusive of every other project I had going at the time. (laughs) You do, don't you? We were like, we have all these things on the calendar, and you're like, cancel cancel everything. Cancel everything. We're not going anywhere. We're writing. (laughs) Three three weeks. (laughs) I'm like, everything? Yep, everything. Yeah. Okay, then. I mean, I did the minimum stuff, but it was really hard. You know, it's like, I met with my students, and... We had the monthly call. I walk with me now. Yeah, you were this close to cancelling that. Everything. Too. Yeah, I nearly cancelled all those things too. But it felt like it was necessary to, for me, anyways, to take a breather and do the other activities also. But yeah, it was That's... like, <laughs> stop everything. We're going to write a book. I've learned through not listening in the past that when this level of urgency is present, I may as well buckle down and listen because what comes has potential, a potential of great impact. And also because it's the energy of urgency arrives, it is because it cannot be postponed to, quote, when I have time, end of quote. Yes, all right. When I got time. When I got time, I'll get on that. You will all of a sudden get time. Yes, you have to. The main character, Josh... It's a Native American man who was inducted into a secret program which aimed to weaponize psychic kids. The character himself, Josh, is based on two people I know and their real life experiences in the program as well as their life afterwards. The other characters are also based on true people and events. All in all, have changed their names, locations and lives as well as having created the Josh character to move their story forward. The story being, if they had been fully awake and aware as adults and organized themselves as a group, What could have happened? And what would they have discovered about the beautiful planet we call Earth? Right. Right. Shall I read the blurb? Um, First, I wanted to say, you know, that um, when you read one of your novels, uh, it's a bit of a fictionalized account of an actual events. And the orders may or may not be accurate, but the information, the data... It's accurate. Yes. Right. Yeah. So these are real experiences that have really happened. But, uh, you know, we've generated enough story around it to make it entertaining to read it. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, if we just read a nonfiction book, this is what happens in the My Lab or the Tiny Team. It's like there are firewalls to that. Yeah. And also, you're, you're it not wouldn't even reach. Buy it. And yeah, it wouldn't reach the majority of the population of Earth, right? Right. And the customers, like, it's just a, you're in a different frame of mind when you're reading Mm -hmm. a nice, interesting novel Mm -hmm. and it allows data to come in. I I equate it to like Mishner, Mishner books, you know, and when I was, uh, I guess from fourth, third, fourth grade, all the way through high school. And for international individuals, fourth grade, how old would you be at fourth grade? I don't know. Seven, eight. 
okay. six, seven, eight. From the time I knew how to read, mm -hmm. I was a uh, constant user of my library card. <laughs> nice. I checked out more books than anyone in the history of the library, probably, you know, because mm -hmm. that was my thing. Anyway, in the library, there were this thickest books in the library. They're like that giant. They were so big. There were like five books in one. Wow. 12 inches. Or? And I was a little bit intimidated by them and I never bought, them. never, never checked them out for oh, years. No. I just saw them. I was like, <clears throat> no, I can't do that. No, mm. no. And then one day I finally did. Right. It's the only books left in the library. Yeah, probably. Like I read everything. I was like, okay, I might as well buck it on for these giant ones. And I pulled it out and they were, the one I read, I think it was called Chesapeake. It's really, really giant. And it ended up being a fictionalized, accurate rendering of history it was the history of the chesapeake bay over ten thousand or fifty thousand years and you know obviously he couldn't know the true what the caveman did in mm -hmm. chesapeake bay but he made up a caveman and did what a caveman would have done mm -hmm. and it was an excellent way to get the the gist of this area's history right right yeah. and fascinated and loved it and that to me is what your books are like yes. it's like that's just a fantastic way to get this information yeah right? And the levels, I mean, why do I do that? Why do I write novels in the first place? That's what actually I like to do. I've been writing novels since I was, before I could write. And um, my brother... Yeah, okay, before you go mm -hmm. too far. Yeah. She's been writing novels since before she could write. Yes. That's like, to me, it's like, I've been reading books since before I could read. Well, how does that work? Right, I'm so about to tell you how it worked. <laughs> tell me. So... How do you write a book before you can write? Mm -hmm. Um... <laughs> When I was very little, before I went to school, and I learned to write, read and write older than most kids because I was the youngest of the family. And by the time the youngest comes along, it's like nothing's that interesting anymore for yeah. the parents or aunties and uncles and grandparents. So I was just left to do my own thing, which didn't include learning how to read and write. So I had to actually learn to read and write when they put me in school, which was when I was six. Right. So this was before I went to school. And um, traditionally, uh, in my lineage, both European and Native American, wisdom was imparted through stories, storytelling. And there's several storytellers in my family. Anyways, I was super young and my, I, I was looking at a book and my brother read it to me because he learned he was a second youngest and he learned to read when he was three or four or something but he was also uh, like four or five years older than me I can't remember exactly how many so by the time I was three or four he knew how to read and write and he was an avid reader reader and I was fascinated by the things that he would read and then a story came through right my first novel and I didn't know how to put it on paper because I didn't know how to write and I really wanted to and my brother said, oh, I know a way. He said, and he showed me the first time that I seen a comic. He comic showed me book. a comic book. He says, this is the way you can tell your story. You just draw pictures showing what happens in your story. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's amazing. I can do that. I can draw. And I was able to draw really well when I was a little kid. I mean, it was Stickman, right? But it was really good for the age. It was age. decipherable. Yeah, actually it was more than decipherable. I was a good draw I could draw really well. Um anyways, um the then I thought, well, where do I do it? How where do I draw on? So he got some paper, like uh what we call now like printer paper, but at the time it was uh, typewriter paper. Um, and there was plenty of that because my mum and dad were professors and they used to write books for the um, universities and stuff. So he grabbed some of those and he cut them into strips and he sewed them together. And then he says, OK, and then he separated them with a with a ruler and a pencil into threes. On each little strip, there was three boxes and there was I don't know how many pages, 10 pages, 12 pages. I don't know. And he says here. Each box is the, the, you know, you start at the beginning and then you're doing a drawing in each box until you finish your story. And we can add more pages if you need to. And I did that. That was my first book. Right? Nice. And it was good. So good that he actually kept it and he kept reading it. That's nice. <laughs> so he was my first, uh, first super fan. reader. My first super fan and my first reader. 
And um, so, yeah, writing books, but it was odd. And he was the only one that paid any attention to it until many years later when I was a teenager. And I'd written multiple short stories and books and things, novels. And then my mom found my work when she was going through my stuff. I don't know why moms go through people's stuff when you're a teenager. She's about 14. <laughs> and she found my work writing and it was all on, uh, you know, jotters in England. It was like notebooks, right? And um, she started reading them. And she's an avid reader too, actually. She, that's where my brother got it. She read, reads like crazy. Actually, my dad also. They're all of them readers, except for my sister. She hated books. She didn't like to read. But everyone else in the family loved to read. And she's like, oh my God, these are so good. So she had, it, this was in the 80s. She had an electric typewriter with a dot matrix printout thingies. And she decided to transcript, uh, to transfer or transcribe. transcribe everything into dot matrix typing because it was all handwritten. So she did that. Right. And she did my short stories, my novel. And then my first no full length novel was there because before that I would only write short stories and novelettes, which is like 20,000 words is a novelette. Right. And the short stories are like 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 words. And um, so she wrote my f out my first novel. And with all my novels, it was doing that tradition because I had so much stuff, information that I, I knew other people didn't have. And I wanted to express it somehow. So I would use, and the genre is always, always science fiction and fantasy, always. And I would use that medium to bring in that information, even then. And a few years ago, my brother found the first chapter of my novel that I wrote when I was 14 and sent it to me. Uh, he took pictures of it in the dope matrix. Printed that matrix. That, yeah. And um, and I was reading it. I read it and I was thinking, oh, my God, this is freaking good. I didn't know I was such a good writer at 14. I mean, I could hardly speak English, but I wrote it right in English. And it was amazing. And the characters and it's like all the information is the exact same information I'm teaching these days. It's the same stuff. So that's the energy. A person can read it and be extremely entertained. It's a page turner. My novels are page turners. You can go at that level or you can get the information and data, right? And I remember one book in the past you proofread and you forgot half the book. Remember that? I got done proofreading it and then uh, you said, okay, now we made a pass. It's time to make a second pass because you'll often miss a lot of things. Yes. And so I started again and I got to halfway through the book and that was the end as far as I remembered it. And there was a whole nother half of a book. It's like, yeah. How did that where happen? did that come from? <laughs> That yeah, that was super cool. Anyway, so that's the writing process, you know. Uh -huh. Process yeah. and style. So yeah. how about the blurb? Okay, here's the book blurb. The book blurb from Team Whisper. Yes. Prepare for a mind-bending journey as Josh, a man with extraordinary abilities, chooses to bury his power in a world that deems them psychotic. Living a life of normancy and drowning in a haze of powerlessness and alcohol, he must now confront the chilling reality that remembering his true self could endanger everyone he holds dear. Brace yourself for a thrilling adventure where amnesia becomes the battleground for Earth's fate. Can Josh rise above his forgotten talents and save the world from sinister forces? Discover a heart-pounding tale of forgotten powers, mortal dangers, and an epic battle for humanity. I gotta tell you, the book starts and you have no idea what's coming <laughs> because from where it starts you go like who is this guy yeah yeah so just to say it's not for kitties it's not a child's it's book it's not a no. child book this where i wouldn't read a child no. read it to a child no. or um play the audiobook for a child no it's definitely pg-13 yeah parental guidance here you know yeah there's no you know Horrible, horrible, but no, it's, there's no, it's, it's adult, not porno, right? adult it's not language, porno. an adult um, topic, yeah. an adult yes. subject. It's pretty strong language and it's pretty strong topics. Yep. So I wouldn't read it to a child. This is not for children. Maybe young adults, <laughs> but not children. So on April 8th, which is in a few days, if you're just listening to this in April 2024, otherwise it's, you can find it somewhere else, but I'll tell you where. On April 8th, 2024, we will have a launch party for this novel. 
Having a launch party for a novel is something new for me. I haven't officially launched any of my previous novels, and most of them go unheard of and undiscovered. Now, with this novel, everything about this novel, novel has been different to all of the other novels I have written. From the time it took to put the first draft down, three weeks, to employing a professional actor for the audiobook, to publishing, publishing an audiobook, all new experiences. Because usually it's more more length of time to get the book down. And matter there's books that are about halfway done that aren't even still done in years later. Well, there's one that's finished. And like, there's one that's finished even that's and it still has not finished. Not completely finished. I haven't done the last proofing of it. And it's like sitting there. That's the third of the Earth Files novels. Right. It's finished. But this but one wanted to be done now. Before. Get yeah, this just done get, and get it out. Yeah, before the other one, so... And the audiobook <laughs> format in a format that we're not. We've never done before. Done. Right. And this novel lends itself to that format mm -hmm. perfectly. Yeah. Well, it was written so that it could be read, actually. Hmm. One of the things that people ask about why I write novels. Is and, why. Oh, is why I write novels. Sorry, I was just in the other book right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, why I write novels. And I remind them of my heritage. My novels are very entertaining page turners, but they're not written just for pure entertainment. They follow the pattern and paths of wisdom keeping and imparting through storytelling. Recently, at a formal author interview, the interviewers asked me, does this book have a message? And I was a bit taken aback by the question, mostly because it's not just one message, <laughs> but also because it's like, why else would you write a book, right? Well, it does it? I asked myself, yes, it has many messages. The main one are about agreement. The fact that nothing can happen in our lives without our conscious or subconscious agreement. That this agreement may or may not be truly chosen, our chosen path. And that no matter how damaged a person is, or how far they seem to have fallen off their path, they can always get up, brush themselves off and get back on their path. And that this is done much easier with good counsel and good allies by their side. Totally. And I think at this moment in the split, right, in the paradigm splitting of realities, it's, it's, it's critical for us to know this. It really is. But of course, like all my novels, they can be read by anyone and everyone will receive what they want to receive from it. With a pure entertainment only to change life life-changing tools and information it's all there you know one of the th cool things about that hmm. that i've seen and people have told me over and over again what's that is that hey i read your novel last year and i read it again this year it's like i'd never read it before there's so much stuff in there that i never even saw the first time does it morph the and book change changes. Through time? <laughs> i swear it changes <laughs> well it's the person that changes oh yeah. Well, there's that. Yes, the person <laughs> changes and they read the novel again and boom, there's all this new information in there. So it is an expansion of awareness tool in itself. Yes. Right. And from an expanded state of awareness, when you read the same thing, you see things that you didn't see when you were a little less expanded. Right. Got right. it. Yeah. And the um, because it's been in pre-purchase and we've already delivered the ebook um, and all these things, you can actually go and ibensnovels.com and grab it right now mm -hmm. um, and if you do grab it before the lunch party then you get a special treat uh, after the lunch party you're going to get a page, page from... from the secret diary of one of the characters it's going to be awesome but anyways I get getting distracted because I get being pulling back by to the novel you know um, what was I saying? Lunch party. Oh, yeah, the lunch April party. 8th. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. And you're reading. You're reading <laughs> okay. It's just that the novel keeps pulling me in, you know, uh, because the second one wants to be written and it's like, come on. Yes, yeah, part you two. Know? Of Jeez. Thing whisper. Yeah. You're right here. Yes, oh, Gazelle. Yeah. Here's and yes, things. Gazelle, Weasel, Monkey, Bear and Panther are real people. And their real names, as well as their experiences as adults, have been changed to explore what would have happened if they had indeed met up again after they left the place they spent their childhood at, the school. Okay. Gazelle, Weasel, Monkey Bear and Panther are characters in the book. Yes. In case you didn't get that, 
Yes. They're not actually animals, they're people, but that's their code names. Code name Panther. Yes. Right. Yeah. The and lunch party is free. And you, as if you're reading or listening to this podcast after April 2024, go to ibensnovels.com slash news to find it and listen to the first chapter of the audiobook. Actually, it's the first two chapters. We're going to do two chapters during that call. Okay. As well as an in-depth interview of the author, me, by the driving to the rest panel of experts. I, I know this watch party is going to be so fun because I've, I've played the audiobook first chapter to a few people uh -huh. who hadn't uh, any idea what this novel's about or anything like that. Yeah. And oh my God, rolling on the floor, laughing. I'm serious. Because <laughs> I could see their eyes. They go, their eyes go like, they're, they're, they're hum to dum dum. Oh yeah, whatever. Play a book, you know, because yeah. they're not like avid book readers most uh -huh. of them right a lot of people don't like to read books yeah yeah That's or true. they don't have time for all these things mm -hmm. so yeah. i play the audiobook a chapter and they're like <laughs> they start going like wait wait what <laughs> what did you just say are you serious are we allowed to laugh is this it's okay to laugh is this funny <laughs> what am i supposed to do here i'm confused <laughs> it's just politically correct to laugh at this to laugh at that i don't think i supposed to <laughs> And I'm laughing and laughing and laughing. And they're like, are you laughing at me or at this book or what's going on here? Oh, man, you got to listen to it. Yes. So um, the humor and the situation that the book starts with, I mean, we can talk a little bit about the very yeah, first Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a, uh, we've seen people on the side of the road living in boxes. Mm-hmm. All, all over town nowadays, more and more often, you know, I think that's yes. a common enough thing. You drive around big cities or outside of towns or even in the middle of town. And there's people camping out, you know, mm -hmm. and generally speaking, they're all. Um, I won't say all because, I mean, how many of those tents have we stopped to check in? Who's no, in there? Pretty, no, we, we haven't, haven't really stopped. No, we haven't stopped. But uh, I have watched videos of people who have stopped. <laughs> OK, so. Generally speaking, there's drugs and alcohol and a desire either to live an alternative life or just a dropping out or some of them are there. Not that many, but some are there just because uh, financial reasons. But for mm -hmm. the most part, there's other things going there's on. There's other choice. yeah, other right. choices. I mean, our cousin, you know. Yeah. I mean, they prefer. They choo like, he chooses that lifestyle. He prefers that because all of the other things distract from the thing that he wants to do. Which right? is take drugs. Yeah. With Take drugs with the friends that can help them get drugs together. You know, they yeah. could, they're a team. They work they're together. Yeah. They support each other in the in their addictions, their addiction and their choice. So our character wakes up in one of those conditions. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. He's not homeless, but. No, but he might as well have well been. Being, I mean, yeah. it didn't get it like he didn't go buy it. He was no, given to him. He was. Yeah. If he didn't have that given to him, he would have been in a box, I'm sure. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So. We are often quick to jump to judgments about yes. what we're seeing. Yeah. That they're a waste of this or that, or there's, I mean, um, many of the people listening to our podcast probably are high frequency people. Mm -hmm. So, generally speaking, our jump to will be uh, they're some form of a victim, right? They're a victim yeah, of some circumstance. A, yeah, they had a tough time of life and blah, blah, blah. You know, sort of ignoring the fact that. Most of us have also gone through these same the situations same too, and yeah. we're not in a box on the street. Right. But we jump to that because we're empathetic and compassionate and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yep. And um, when you meet Josh, you're going to have those things and maybe worse. <laughs> it's like, man. Yes. So uh, I don't really want to spoiler it too much, but you, you kind of get the picture. So Josh isn't uh, that guy. No, he's not a bad guy. He's the opposite, actually. He's the only good guy in the entire book. <laughs> <laughs> he's the original light worker. Right? He's the original light worker. Totally. totally. Yeah. So. But we have to understand that he was also weaponized as a kid because he has psychic abilities, right? Like so it's weaponized to empathy things. And yes. Things like that. Yes. Topics like that is like, how can empathy be weaponized, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how can a powerful light worker who only wants to do good be i guess manipulated in doing bad things i guess it okay say bad things i mean good and bad things there are bad things yeah right how could he be manipulated into doing that and what's the consequence of becoming aware of that right right 
It's a lot of things that you will explore in this novel. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, it's likely that not, a, not, not many of us are actually, you know, went to this school. Mm -hmm. But at a level, at one level or another, we've... We kind of did. We kind of did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> at a level of societal programming or um, the, the, the way in which we figured out how to handle the fact that we could see more than other people, that we're different to other people, all of those things. You didn't need to go to a, a special school to be weaponized to have those experiences. I think a lot of people can relate. Yep. And even the... I, I've met many individuals who had most of their adult life spent in a haze of alcohol to suppress their psychic abilities, right? It's like that is true for, I remember when I was 16 or so or 15, I was visiting with some friends and I'd had a, one of those dreams that didn't come true. And I would have been questioning about, was that a dream that I had prophetic or am I creating the situation and it's going to happen because I'm creating it? And it was killing me inside. And I went downstairs for breakfast and the dad used to get up at like at five o'clock in the morning to cook for everybody because he had like 10 kids, right? And two of those, two of the boys of that family were my friends. They were about the same age as me. And um, so I went down there and he was already in the kitchen cooking um, like a whole massive bag of sausages and five cartons of 12 eggs each. <laughs> it was like he had a big kitchen huge family and he always friends staying around always you know he would pick up homeless people <laughs> as well not just random homeless people he was street smart very street smart uh but you know friends would fall in off the wagon and stuff like that but anyways he told me a story right he said he looked at me he was psychic right he looks at me he says you're not causing this shit this is prophetic um, you may be able to affect it. Likelihood is that you won't be able to affect the result, but you're not causing it. I'm like, what? How did you know what I was thinking? You know, it's like, because I'm like you. And uh, he said, I'm going to tell you a story. And I want you to remember this story. This is okay. Because he was also a part native. He was Chilean. And he told he wisdoms through storytelling, which was something normal in that environment for me, right? Uh, friends of the family, my mom's friends and stuff, also part native. And storytelling was part of our culture. So I sat down, he gave me the sausages, toast and eggs. It's okay, just eat and I'll tell you the story. And he said, when I was um, a young person like you, he said, uh, I started thinking the same thoughts, that I was causing all these negative things coming about. When it was prophetic dreams of pretty things and nice things, it was great. But when it was nasty stuff, it wasn't great. And it didn't matter what I did. I couldn't stop it. And I started believing that I was causing it. So my only solution, he said, was to stop the prophetic dreams from coming. And the best way that I found, the best method that I found was to always be drunk. So I started drinking alcohol, a lot of it. And the years went by, a decade went by, another decade went by, and... In the meantime, I had gone grown up, I'd got married, I'd had kids, I lost my family, I lost my jobs, I then got married again, had more kids, and I lost them too, all because of this drinking, and then I decided, you know what, I'm just going to drink until I die. I'm going to drink to death. And all so that those dreams wouldn't come, that knowing wouldn't come. And the only way I could stop it was by drinking so much alcohol that I would pass out all the time. Like, whoa, okay. Um, so he said, one day when I took that final decision, I'm going to kill myself through alcohol poisoning. I sat down, had several bottles and I took them all. And um, he said, the, the next thing I know is I wake up in a hospital morgue. In the morgue? Yes. Wow. He woke up, and this is Chile in the 1960s, I don't know, like, I think it was the 60s, maybe 50s. This was a long time ago. 
And he was an old guy by the time I met him. Um, he said in that hospital, it was the public hospital. So they didn't have the little boxes where you put the dead bodies. They threw them in a room. So the pile of corpses. And I woke up in the pile of corpses. My gosh. Yeah, it was a bad experience. I wake up, I look around, and I start screaming, right? <laughs> so some people arrive all scared and everything. They pull me out of there and they tell me that I had arrived at the hospital dead and looked down and I looked down and his body was three or four times the size because his liver was about to explode, right? So I put him on a stretcher, took him to a room, and a surgeon came in, a very tired overworked surgeon entered the room and he says all right then he says um here's the thing i've got a whole bunch of surgeries to do for people who want to live and who are going to stay sober and i'd rather spend my time with them than with you who obviously have drunk yourself to death because you were dead when you got here and your liver needs to be cut down because otherwise it's gonna you're gonna die again it needs to be sh like, they have to cut most of it off or something. I don't know. He told me that it had to be shrunk by surgery or whatever. It's cut off, like a lot of it off. Um, I think most of it was dead or something. I don't know what that is, you know, how it works or anything. So he says, you have to make a decision and you have to make it now. Do I operate? Do I spend the next 10, 12, 20 hours operating on you? Spend all that time that I could be saving other people. Or, uh, and you're going to stay sober for the rest of your life and you're going to make good for your life. Or shall I go and spend the, that time with others because the first thing you're going to do when you come out of this hospital is go to the nearest bar and get drunk. So what's it going to be? So he took the decision, obviously, right? It's yes, I'm going to stay alive and I'm going to stay sober. Okay. I wonder why he picked then. I don't know. I guess sometimes, you know, they do say you got to hit rock bottom, and I don't think it's much worse than waking up in a pile of corpses. <laughs> I don't think so. He, cho he made that choice, right? Right. And so the surgeon spent how many hours, a couple of days working on his liver, um, and then he got out and he had months and months of recovery, and he met an old guy who told, gave him that story. Not that same story, but the thing is, told him, you're not causing this, you're seeing. And, you know, this is why, how it works, right? Because even though these skills and things are all over the world, the, the response of society in modern society is, here's some drugs to shut it off. You're a nutter, you're crazy. Or you see that people think that you're being crazy or you think you're crazy or what I was thinking is like I'm causing this. Causing, yeah. Causing it. And nobody's there to tell you otherwise because there are neither wise people around, right? No elders. It happens that there was orchestrated for me to make friends of two of his boys. And I was staying in his house, that he was making breakfast and he knew exactly what I was thinking when I came into the kitchen. So that was all orchestrated so I didn't go down that path, do you see? And he had had a similar orchestration and some other old guy told him, hey, you're not causing this. It's totally normal. And this is what you do with it. And also the, he also taught me about the, the noise, you know, because you hear everybody's thoughts all the time. And then he taught me the trick of imagine um, a, volume. a volume knob and you just turn it down or a gauge, you know, and boom, silence. And I was like, what? <laughs> right? So it's pretty cool, but... It's like that's the Josh in this is was in that situation, you know, for some reason, whatever that we're going to find out in the book, he had to shut stuff off. When he was aware and conscious and being himself, he had to shut it off, and the rest of the time he had to forget. So, we'll find out why in the novel. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, so we'll see you April eighth or any day. Yes. April 8th for sure. Yes. April. Show up to the, the watch party. Yes. The watch party is going to have two chapters of the audiobook and then uh, questions. And, and I'm going to love watching people's faces when they're hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> what? Okay. Can't yeah. wait to see it. Yeah. So go to ibensnovels.com slash news. And I hope 
there'll be a link in the uh, show notes. Yeah, we're going to also send the links in the show notes in this newsletter. And we'll put it on our Telegram channel. The Telegram channel that we have. <clears throat> in Elia Benz there um, and we have a newsletter a yeah. we'll send on the newsletter so you yeah. should be able to get to it yeah without too much difficulty yeah okay see you there see you there bye love you darling so the the man who start goes is a movie about one of these programs with adults where um, they were trying to make by just looking at the goats or the brains, trying to give them some sort of stroke or something, and the goat will die. And I don't remember how the movie went, but in real life, it's possible. It's, that's actually possible. People can do that.